I'm Ed Griffin. I'm an author, researcher. I've written some books. Um, I've written a book most recently of interest called The Creature from Jekyll Island, A Second Look at the Federal Reserve System. And I've written other things on the United Nations called The Fearful Master. I wrote a book on uh, natural cancer research and therapy called uh, World Without Cancer. Well, the United Nations is different things to different people. Most people think that the UN is our last best hope for peace. That's the way it was uh, sold to me when I was in school. Uh, it was uh, offered as an organization uh, where different nations could come together and work out their problems and their grievances in a peaceful manner and um, be a means of uh, reducing world conflict and increasing the economic prosperity of all of the member nations and all of these wonderful things. In reality, it turns out to be none of the above. In reality, the United Nations is a, a the seat of what the member governments hope will become a true world government. It's to be a government. And there's nothing inherently wrong with a world government, but we need to ask the question, what kind of a world government is this going to be? If the United Nations were going to be a government based on all of the things they've said it was going to be, peace and prosperity and protecting individual rights and all of these things, I think it'd be pretty hard to oppose it. But in reality, it's being built as a model of collectivism. The political ideology that is inherent in the United Nations is collectivism. It's a word that probably needs to be defined for our purposes here, but in general, it means a totalitarian system, a system of uh, concentration at the top and the people being at the bottom being ruled from above, not that the people have any voice in determining the direction of their government or the world, but they are to be told what the direction is, and they're to be told to follow it. Collectivism is a philosophy of big government and small people, and it's a philosophy that supposedly uh, all of this is being done in the name of society. In other words, it's for the greater good of the greater number, supposedly. And so you're supposed to go along with whatever inconvenience or uh, insult to your freedom comes along, because after all, it's in the greater good uh, of the greater number. And this is the, the rationale being used, has been used for quite some time, to justify all kinds of horrible atrocities. All the leaders have to do is say, well, it's for the greater good of the greater number. That's the philosophy that's built into the United Nations from top to bottom. And so therefore, the answer to the question, what is the United Nations? The United Nations is a budding or building world totalitarian system. Uh, the United States has always been the major supporter and financer of the United Nations. So you'd have to say that the key people behind the United Nations are the globalists, I think is the best word to use to describe them, in the United States. Now who are they? They would be politicians, they would be people in the State Department, and they would be international financiers. You must remember, for example, that the, the land uh, where the United Nations is uh, seated was purchased by the Rockefellers and donated to uh, the United Nations. Well, they didn't do that as a, as a means of uh, uh, being great humanitarians, although that's the image that many people have. They did because they had a keen interest in building this new world order and they thought this would be the seat for it and so that's why they did that. So the people behind it in the United States are the international financiers who are located here, the, primarily the Rockefeller group and what's left to the old J.P. Morgan group and some of the larger banks. But primarily, um, you find most of these people in an organization uh, that is uh, not well known, but definitely very important. It's called the Council on Foreign Relations. It's a group in the United States with about 4,000 members at the most. And yet these people, number one, are all dedicated to building a new world order, a global government, based on the model of collectivism. And number two, you find them at the top of most of the important organizations in this country. You find them in government. About half of our presidents and vice presidents and uh, just about all of our secretaries of state 
and secretaries of defense and heads of the CIA and the FBI and all of the important positions in government. If you look at who these people are over the years, they're members of this Council on Foreign Relations. Most of the great universities they have as their president or their board of directors dominated members of the Council on Foreign Relations. The news channels, ABC, CBS, NBC, the Turner Broadcasting System, uh, Murdoch. I mean, Murdoch is a well-known member of the Council on Foreign Relations. So all of these major power centers of society are in the hands of this small group, under 4,000 members. And so you ask who's behind it. If you want a list, that's a good place to start. Uh, write to the Council on Foreign Relations office in uh, New York, as I have done every year, and I ask for a membership report or an annual report. And on the back of each report, they proudly list all of their members. So that's where you find who is behind the United Nations. That's a hard word for many people to accept, or, or a phrase, to accept that we have an internationalist elite. A lot of people believe that, you know, in this country, we're the uh, masters of our own political destiny. We don't have an elite. Maybe we have some rich people. Yes, we have some powerful people. But the idea of an elite, or an international elite, elite is foreign to the thinking of a lot of Americans. But the truth is, we do have one. And their intention is to, number one, maintain their positions of uh, being the elite, having uh, vast power and control and financial wealth. And number two, to extend it to the international level. Uh, we have these international elites, we call them international, but basically they're housed in each nation. We have them in England and France and the United States and Germany and so forth. And now the big move among these people is to coalesce into a true international elite whereby uh, they will be operating through the, the governmental power of the United Nations. Now uh, they, uh, they really have clout because there's no nation in the world that can escape their power because the, the way these people work is that they, if they want to accomplish something, if they have an agenda, uh, let's just pick one at, uh, at random, a disarmament or another one, uh, population control or something like that. Uh, as it is now, they have to convince each of the respective nations and their governments to implement those agendas. But once you have a true United Nations with a true governmental power, with uh, real military forces, and once you have uh, turned over to these uh, uh, these agencies of international power control over your armies and over your air force and over your weapons of mass destruction, you have created a global government which is uh, cannot be challenged by any nation whatsoever. So now these international elites do not have to worry about uh, convincing the governments in each uh, part of the world as long as they control the center of this power, which is the United Nations. They therefore can control the world. It's a very heady wine, I'm sure, and, but that's what their objective is. But uh, the obligation of the United States to the United Nations on a legal front uh, has become entwined in these things we call treaties. So if you're talking as a globalist uh, or as an internationalist and you want to see the building of this new world order, you would say that our obligation to the United Nations is legal and it's binding because the United Nations has the status of a treaty. And then we have all these sub-treaties that follow along after it, NAFTA and GATA, GATA and all of these organizations that are created, those are all based on treaty agreements. And so piece by piece, they have been weaving this fabric around us like the little, so, uh, the little silk threads uh, that the Lilliputians wrapped around, uh, who was the, uh, Gulliver, <laughs> Gulliver's travels. I mean, any one thread you could break, but Gulliver woke up one morning and he had these thousands of little threads around his body and although he was a giant compared to them he could not move they had captured him so i think that's basically what's going on and in that sense we have this obligation to the united nations because we're being bound down by thousands of treaties and uh, it's destroying our independence